Hello and welcome to this video which is introducing uh, the course Introduction to Art, Antiquities, Cultural Heritage and the Law at the Faculty of Law at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. My name is Stephen Gallagher and I'm a professional consultant and professor of practice and law at CUHK Law. Um, the idea of this video is to give uh, an introduction to the course but it also is a bit of a taster on generally on issues to do with our antiquities, cultural heritage and law as well. So the course is run in Hong Kong um, on our Masters in Law program. Uh, it is open to other students who are on other programs with us, including our Juris Doctor program as well. Um, but many people would ask why? Why would you run a course on art, antiquities, cultural heritage and the law in Hong Kong? When we think of Hong Kong, we think of this modern skyline. Um, but of course, there is more to Hong Kong than this. In fact, of course, that is a uh, a photograph of Victoria Harbour by night, but the Victoria Harbour itself is, of course, very important cultural heritage, a very important heritage uh, centre. It arguably should be a world heritage site, but there are political reasons that perhaps it's not been nominated for that in the past, and uh, that would be something we would discuss on the course. If we are thinking of heritage, then we often don't. We think of old buildings. We think of uh, uh, old artworks and everything. And again, a modern city like Hong Kong, what's it got to do with heritage? Well, of course, China generally is full of heritage. If we think of world heritage, we think of world heritage sites like the Great Wall of China. And of course, uh, China, I think, is now only second to Italy with the number of world heritage sites in the world. So China, Asia generally full of heritage. But what about Hong Kong? If we think about Hong Kong's heritage, one of the things we have to consider is what we mean by the term cultural heritage. So we'll talk about the legal meaning of it in the six international conventions uh, that deal with what today we would term cultural heritage. And we deal with the popular meaning as well. And the popular meaning, well, that could include things in Hong Kong, such as the loss of American style eateries, uh, which a few years ago when we lost now Dan Ryan's in Pacific Place in central of Hong Kong, a headline said, you know, this is part of Hong Kong's cultural heritage. At the time, I thought that was ridiculous. And I mentioned that on a Facebook and a, a LinkedIn post. And of course, I then got my former students going, no, 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 this is part of our heritage. This is part of our cultural heritage. So it meant that I had to think again about what cultural heritage is. And again, that's what we do on the uh, course. Many people, of course, would think of old buildings as being cultural heritage. And of course, there are problems. There are issues facing old buildings. In fact, often they are being developed. So we'll talk a little bit about some of the issues to do with old buildings. Um, we start talking about what buildings would count as heritage in Hong Kong and perhaps in other places around the world as well. But we talk about the threats to them, including development and the response of people to the threat of losing their cultural heritage. In Hong Kong in December of 2020, uh, we learned of this wonderful, um, at least by our standards, let's say, um, underwater reservoir in uh, a place that's now turned Bishop's Hill uh, down near Sham Shui Po in uh, the um, uh, Kowloon of Hong Kong. And the fact that the water authorities were demolishing it and locals had seen this and we got people who, who went in there, took photographs and said, this is an amazing structure. Why are you getting rid of it? It's part of our heritage. It's part of our history. Public opinion. The government immediately distanced itself and said, this is nothing to do with us. This is the, 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 the water department on their own have made this decision. And we would suggest that they, they consider again. And the water department did respond and they are now preserving this building. So public opinion will be talking about the importance in that in the protection, the preservation, the conservation of all forms of cultural heritage, but in particular, built heritage. We'll talk about issues that have gone on around the world with what we would term embarrassing heritage, uh, changing views to do with heritage, particularly monuments and statues, and of course, the toppling of statues, um, the bringing down of statues, why this happens, whether it should happen, whether the law permits it, whether we're involving criminal and civil law here in the destruction and the toppling of statues. And we'll say why generally, um, people seem, yeah, there are some people who are against the toppling of some statues, but let's think about international organisations like UNESCO, which often speaks out when there is destruction of heritage, but keeps very quiet when it's certain forms of heritage. But more likely to be uh, uh, voluble about things like this, when we see terrorist organisations uh, attacking heritage and destroying statues and other things. And we have to try and talk about that, the, the issues that arise during armed conflict, during 
terrorist actions as well. And the difference between the toppling of this statue and perhaps the destruction of this statue. Uh, we have to try and work out why there are different attitudes. We think about other crimes against heritage and art. Uh, recently, of course, there's been an attack on the Mona Lisa, and we'll try and talk about uh, the forms of crime that can involve art as well. Art crimes generally. We'll talk about the theft of art, including the theft of graffiti, um, and whether you can actually have a theft of graffiti, where of course graffiti should be something which is illegal in itself. You know, if you uh, uh, put graffiti on a building, you are doing this usually without the, the permission of the owners. That's the, the meaning of the term graffiti. Well, usually that term is, is, is criminal damage. It's an offense in itself. So, you know, can you have theft of something that's created from a crime as well? Can you have ownership of something that's created by a crime? Who owns it? Does the artist have any rights? in graffiti when of course they are performing an illegal act so we have to talk about all those things and that leads us into more consideration of things like artist rights including of course um, uh, the violation of artists rights and how easy that can be today in our modern society where images are used so easily and the reaction of artists including of course um, artists who have power who have money and of course the one the reaction of artists who don't have power and, and money what they can actually do here we see Ai Weiwei and his uh, comment on Volkswagen's unauthorized use of his artworks. Talking about that general idea of people's rights, of ownership, art and antiquities, buying, selling, crimes involving them, we have to talk about things like, can you own human remains? Human remains have often been incorporated into artworks in the past, or perhaps are considered to be artworks in themselves. They are often bought and sold. Can you buy and sell artworks? that involve human remains? Can you buy and sell the dead on eBay? Well, obviously you can, because on the 6th of June, this skeleton was for sale on eBay. It's been on sale for eBay for about three years. I would suggest because the price is probably a bit too high, considerably too high. What's the going rate for a skeleton? How much do you have to pay for a skull? Should we be buying and selling human remains? Should eBay be buying and selling human remains or allowing this back on their platform. They have a strict rule that they don't allow human body parts to be sold, but of course the rule is not really enforced as well. Then we'll start talking about the formula of collections. And of course that means we have to start talking about museums. And it gives me a chance to share some of my favorite jokes about museums as well, including this one. Why are the pyramids in Egypt? Because they were too heavy to carry to the British Museum. Ouch. Um, we have to talk about that. The forming of these colonial collections and other collections in other forms of museums as well, the problems with them as they are perceived today. And maybe I'll speak up a little bit for the British Museum and for others of these colonial museums as well. We'll talk about repatriation, we'll talk about the removal, the release of these items from, uh, um, controversial items from the museums, perhaps back to former colonies. Um, and again, some of the issues with the with these repatriations as well. We'll talk about the continuing problems for museums in the fact that they seem to keep on buying looted artworks and antiquities. So we have to talk about the case of the um, Australian National uh, uh, Gallery, which of course purchased this uh, Buddha on the left here, which subsequently turned out to have been looted from India and how that happened, how embarrassing it was, why the museum didn't check, what checks it did perform, why, it involves Hong Kong because this does, uh, this particular item does involve Hong Kong as well. And then we'll talk about the item on the right. That's the gold sarcophagus that was purchased by the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York and then returned uh, because it is presumed to have been obtained illicitly. Um, so we have to start talking about that as well. These items often today, we, we don't have a great deal of evidence. The one on the left, there was a lot of evidence that this has been looted, but for some of the others, we haven't got that much evidence that they've been looted, but, but the, the tide seems to shift towards these items being presumed to be looted at times. And we have to talk about how international law and domestic laws and practices have actually led to this. We'll talk about items that were looted further back in the past. And of course, for us, we have to think about things like the bronze zodiac heads from the zodiac fountain at the old summer palace in Beijing. Um, we get the looting of these heads. They have become a famous image for China in the uh, history of the um, century of humiliation uh, when colonial forces, the British, the French, the Germans keep going, the Americans, all of them went in and at times took 
land and took heritage antiquities from China as well. And China's attempts to get some of this back and how they've actually worked this. Again, we have to talk about Hong Kong here because Hong Kong has played a major part in the sale of some of these heads. So how can Hong Kong, part of China, have been host to sales of things that were looted from China in the past? We have to think about that word loot, by the way, uh, because it's a very loaded word. It probably doesn't mean today, but it probably didn't mean in the past exactly what it means today. So we'll talk about Queen Victoria's dog, Looty, uh, and why that was a funny name at the time and probably a little bit more of an uncomfortable name today. Um, we'll talk about modern cases of theft and looting, including the dispute over this Buddha. Again, there are question marks about whether it ever was stolen or whether it ever was looted. Uh, but we have to talk about the cases that have been involved with this Buddha, including those in the Netherlands and those in China as well. So this Buddha is meant to have been looted from a village in southern China, bought by a collector in uh, the Netherlands, again, from someone who bought it from a dealer in Hong Kong. So again, it has a Hong Kong connection. So again, this is why we talk about these things in Hong Kong. Oh, again, this brings us back to our uh, human body parts and human remains as well, because of course this Buddha is, uh, is famous. Why? Because it is it has a human being inside it, the skeleton of a human being inside it. We'll talk about uh, changing attitudes to uh, materials that make up art and antiquities, including things like, of course, ivory, um, and Hong Kong's ban on the sale of ivory. Well, Hong Kong's sort of ban on the sale of ivory. Um, and of course, what's going on uh, today, which is the 8th of June, uh, 2022, in England, where we have a law that's being in brought into effect, which is, is one of the strictest restrictions on the uh, sale of ivory in the world and, and other uh, products from endangered species as well. So we can talk a little bit about that, including in Hong Kong, of course, when it becomes embarrassing if you're a government that says that you're trying to ban the sale of ivory, and then you have a sale that you've organized because it is property that is, is represents the property of uh, a government official who's been convicted of uh, corruption offenses. Um, and of course, you're trying to get some money back from the uh, this particular person who's now declared bankrupt, but it turns out that some of the things that are being sold in the sale are ivory. Um, yeah, it's all, um, it all can be quite embarrassing and, and show that perhaps one part of government doesn't know what another part of government is is doing at times. Um, so we do wonder how much, of course, all of this around the world, this issue to do with endangered species, how much these things are really being implemented and how much is, is cosmetic. We need to talk about important sales of artworks, including this, of course, the most expensive public sale of an artwork in the world, the Salvatore Mundi, sold for 400 million US dollars. Uh, and we talk about this in a number of ways. We talk again about the ideas of provenance, of ownership, of again, the art market generally. And then we have to talk about things like fakes. Um, do I wanna call this a fake? Well, possibly not a fake, but, but there are some people who, who do question the authenticity of this. Is it a Leonardo? Is it a school of Leonardo by a pupil of Leonardo, a circle of Leonardo? Is it a little bit Leonardo and a lot? restoration because this is what it looked like when it was originally found 10, 10 years before it was actually sold and um yeah very different today is it really a leonardo we have to start talking about authenticity we have to start talking about fakes and forgeries and of course in amongst everything else we have to think about technology and law and technology and art law and technology as well so we'll talk about this We'll talk about the sale of people's every days back in March of 2021 uh, for then uh, 69 million US dollars, making people one of the most expensive living artists at the times. This, of course, is an NFT. Um, well, actually, it's not an NFT. Is it? Everyone says this is an NFT, but it's not an NFT. This is a digital representation of a digital representation of a digital artwork, because, of course, people's artwork every day is the first 5,000 days is a digital artwork. It's not an NFT. An NFT is just, well, what is an NFT? That's what we have to talk about. The NFT, that's what everyone says was sold at Christie's in March of 2021. But no, of course, the NFT was just really part of what was sold at the time. But we're into the hype of NFTs. We have to talk about what they are, what benefits they offer the art world, what benefits they offer artists, 
what, pro what, sorry, what benefits they will offer buyers and dealers and platforms, and what problems there are with them as well, including, of course, issues with ownership, with theft, which should really be impossible of, uh, of things on the blockchain that seems to be happening very regularly. And of course, we have to talk about the intellectual property issues that arise, the artist rights issues that arise with these NFTs as well. So that's a sort of breakneck through what we cover in the course. If you're interested, please feel free to contact me at any point. Um, there is a, a, a YouTube channel uh, which you can look at to do with um, other um, more in-depth considerations of things that we cover on the course as well. And my email is at the top. And I'm always interested to hear from people, even if you're not interested in the course, if you're interested in any of these things that we've been talking about, um, then I'm always interested to hear from people. So thank you very much for watching the video. And uh, hopefully I'll get to talk to you about issues to do with our antiquities, cultural heritage and the law at some point. Bye bye.